a lot of people think that Christians don't have struggles, that everything should be rosy and everything should be easy. If we just believe that God will make a, a clear path for us and, and life will be so simple compared to the rest of the world. But we know that that's certainly not the case. And I can see sometimes when I look back in my life, when I've had the most struggle or, or had the most uh, going on in my life, when I felt the least confident about being able to solve my own problems, that's when God was able to shine through. And God was able to give me guidance because I, I realized I could not do it all myself. And in those humbling moments, I think that's when God really steps up and is able to be heard. I think God's always speaking and God is always helping us in our times of trial and our times of struggle. But, but when we submit and we realize, okay, God, I can't, you've got to, I think God really does pull through and it strengthens our faith and it helps us to realize that all this faith that we've been building, all these things that we've been reading about in the scripture and, and practicing in our faith communities, it means something because God is really there. Yeah, I think in times of struggle and doubt, in my own experience, I, I just bump up against my limits of, of understanding and um, answers. And I can think of specific seasons in my life when I faced um, the death of someone I loved um, at a very early age in my life and realizing that some of the easy answers didn't fit anymore um, and yet realizing that the God I had worshiped in church every Sunday and learned about in Sunday school, just as you were saying, was there in a deeper way. And there were still lots of unanswered questions and there was more mystery, but the presence of God, I felt more deeply than I ever had before. And that was true throughout my life, still is. It's in those times of, ah, you know, struggle and doubt when I'm reaching my limits that God is there. I think we all start in faith thinking that it'll be an easy road from point A to point B, a straight line, but there are a lot of twists and a lot of valleys to go up there. And I think what you're saying is resonates with me. In seminary, part of my education was being a chaplain in a kids hospital in an ICU unit, and I saw the death of a little boy with cystic fibrosis. And I remember going out into the night and calling God a few names. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I discovered that, no, <laughs> you have to do the Job thing. You have to be able to know that God is much greater than we can ever imagine. And we have to bump up against it. I, I like how you said about humility. We have to learn our limits so we can know that God is unlimited, but it's an all, it's a all consuming struggle and it's a lifetime struggle. Last year, my congregation read through the Bible together and I preached through the Bible uh, throughout the course of the year. And one of the questions that came up again and again when we were in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament was, there's so much violence. And um, it seems to be such a contrast with the message we hear from Jesus, love your enemies and turn the other cheek. And how do we reconcile this is one God, the same God in the Old and New Testaments, um, and yet our understanding and, and how we uh, react in the world uh, seems to be so different in, in the Old and New Testaments. And, and today we see people of faith who believe in the one God uh, calling for violence, revenge, mm -hmm. retaliation, exclusion. Um, and so thinking through those questions and one of the things I offered to my congregation in those conversations was, um, this is the story of our relationship with the one true God, the God that we have come to know in the revelation and life and teachings of Jesus. And so it's through that lens that we read all of the texts, the lens of, of love, and that's the lens through which we read the world. Um, and for me, I think Jesus was nonviolent and that violence is, is never the right response of faith in our world. I can understand it, it comes from a very human place, but through our relationship with God in Christ, I think those feelings of wanting revenge, wanting to hit back can be transformed. Doesn't mean we just become doormats and that we don't 
um, hold one another accountable that we don't stand up to injustice and wrong. Um, but I think we're called to do that in a very different way from violence and retaliation. I think when we deal with why is it so violent in the Old Testament and so much love in the new uh, caricature, we have to remember the Bible is a book of history as well, uh, of people struggling with real life issues, with a lot of violence, as they come to know who this Yahweh, who this God really is. So whenever I read some of the horrific yeah. um, desires for revenge we see in Lamentations or in Psalms, I always have to remember that we have to read it, as you say, through the eyes of Jesus. Yeah, that Jesus is a revelation and some of those more violent passages about revenge and so forth actually can help us understand the power of Jesus' words about turn the other cheek. As difficult as that is, how we play that out, what's happening right now in Gaza, where violence begets violence, it's a challenge for us to be able to proclaim and embody peace as and the justice that peace requires in order to finally break that cycle of violence. And Jesus embodied that. You know, I think about how powerful the witnesses today are that are of peace. I think about how our culture so much is, it really has, has evolved into an eye for an eye once again, and or devolved into that. It's in our politics, in our rhetoric, in our discourse, and in our physical violence um, that has manifested itself around the world as well. I mean, you open up the newspaper or you get on your computer and you read about all these places that are erupting in new violence all the time, and there seems to be no kind of solution for that. And then I look back and I think about the examples of peace. I think about the, the witness of Martin Luther King Jr. I'm from Alabama, and so that, that resonates with me so very deeply, how that transformed a culture and transformed a nation and, and continues to transform generations. And I think how his, his witness was rooted in the cause and the example and the witness of Christ. And I think how that witness continues if we have the courage to be a people of peace, a people who do not go to our human instinct of retaliation. And um, if we can be those people who stand up for what we believe in and do it with great love, then I think we do continue to transform the world as he did and as Christ did. My family of origin, as a wee little one, started in the Baptist Church. Southeast Missouri, loved the church as a, as a little one. When my dad remarried after my mother's death, my stepmother was a Methodist, and I was about eight or so. Around that time, people in the Baptist Church, kids, were getting dunked for immersion baptism. I would have none of that. So I became a Methodist. <laughs> we used a lot less water. And I remember after being baptized with that, the drops, the next Sunday I said, Dad, that was fun, can we do it again? Obviously I've learned a lot about theology <laughs> after or since that, but it's my parents, my mom and my dad and my stepmom taking me to church every Sunday even into my teen years where I discovered Christ in church. Did not want to go, but it was the discipline and the love of my parents that enabled me to find Christ. I think about my um, history on both sides of my family is Methodist, like for generations. And we were an every Sunday kind of family, Sunday school, youth group, youth choir, all of the things. And I think through that experience, one of the things I learned was about the unconditional love of God through this community mm -hmm. of faith. My parents, my dad in particular, um, taught Sunday school, an adult Sunday school class every Sunday, and I'd see him out in the den with his commentaries and reading, and he was engaging his mind. And one of the things he taught me was that you can ask any question that your faith goes alongside your intellect and the development of the mind. And so don't be afraid to ask questions and to doubt and to, to struggle um, in your faith. 
And so there was this combination of you can question, you can struggle and doubt, and also know that you're held and loved. And it wasn't perfect. You know, there are all sorts of things going on in family and in church. Um, but those were the deep messages that, that stuck with me and really shaped, um, shaped my faith and my life. I love these stories. I love how our families have molded and shaped who we are. I too had the kind of family that we were in church and my parents were always there volunteering. And I didn't realize everybody didn't have that experience. It was a long time before I realized that not everybody went to church every Sunday, not everybody stepped up and volunteered. I can remember my parents volunteering um, when the church newsletter said they needed volunteers in the nursery or they needed someone to to help the youth with a car wash or they needed to have somebody cook supper for the senior citizens whatever it was my parents were always there and so i just assumed that's what being a christian meant that if you are able and capable, why would you not um, respond to God's call and, and respond to the needs of the community, whatever they are? So that's how I got involved, like my parents, like my siblings, like everybody else in, in mission work and in, in learning more about the Bible, in um, forming community and, and using my gifts to be able to, to contribute. So I, I love that that's, that's how we got to this place and we were able to experience the love of Christ through that. Well, friends, like I said, I grew up in church. I didn't know everybody else didn't grow up in church. And so I think I was formed and shaped and I had these influences in my life that I didn't realize were influencing me. I can remember Ann Hightower who picked up the pens and the pencils and straightened all the pews after church every Sunday. I can remember Dot Paul, who always played the music. I can remember the pastor. I remember all the, the oh, I don't remember all the sermons, forgive me, <laughs> but I do remember the love that, that he shared and, and the sincerity that, that he, he experienced when he shared the gospel with us. I, I, remember, um, I remember when someone cried at a funeral. I remember the, the way that, um, that Don's voice shook when he volunteered for the children moment, but he did it anyway. And so all of these people together made me realize how, how precious it is uh, that no matter who you are and what your gift and, and what you are called to do, if you just say yes, then, um, then you have a witness and you're going to help form and shape the people who are watching because that was me. And um, I just, my, one of my favorite stories is when I responded to God's call in my life to become a pastor. I had a conversation with my mom and dad. We had no pastors in our family, but I don't remember initiating that conversation. They don't remember me having the conversation. We all remember that it happened, but it was so natural because this is what the community kind of had, had brought me up to do, to respond to God's call, just like they all had. And, um, and so here I am today, and I'm so very thankful for all those, those witnesses of people who lived faithful lives around me. As I was listening to you name those names, I was thinking of people in my own childhood, all the names of youth counselors and Sunday school teachers and musicians. Um, and as I think about that question, who are some of the people in your life who've influenced your faith? Another person that came to my mind was my college roommate, who was and is an atheist, um, who had a lot of um, negative feelings about Christians and about church and about organized religion. And we were also best friends and are still very dear friends and um, had a connection that was genuine and real and a love for each other, a respect for each other. And so we would get in these really good conversations where she would ask me questions about my faith. And, um, and so I had to think about things and think about um, how love expands and includes all kinds of people. And um, she sort of sharpened me in some ways and uh, expanded my heart um, and my understanding of who God is and how God is um, expressed and revealed in the world. And she was actually the first person to suggest I become a pastor. Oh. So we laugh about that. I'm like, you don't even like organized religion. And she's like, well, if someone's going to be a pastor, it should be you. <laughs> so we, I think 
gained understanding through each other. And she told me that she really had a lot of respect for my faith and for the person of Jesus from some of the conversations we'd had. So um, those conversations in the midst of a very loving and trusting relationship were really transformative for me. When I saw that this was a question that we would be talking about, I started going through, oh, this person would be good. Oh, oh, so this person, maybe this person. And it dawned on me, I'm not going to talk about any of those persons. I can't, because there are too many of them. I retired after 43 years in ministry. And as I looked back at the different congregations, including campus ministry, uh, where I was privileged to serve, I learned so much about myself, about God, about love, about faith, simply by seeing these people live out their lives, live out their discipleship. Things they saw, things they encountered, I was amazed at how they had the strength of character, the courage, the um, insight of faith, the practice of love to move them ahead. And I learned more, sort of like you said, uh, your, your heart is opened and your eyes are opened when you simply see the tapestry of the disciples through the years. I would wish that anybody would know that pastors are pastored by the people they are called to serve. Yeah. When I think about relationships with other people, all kinds of folks, whether they're people of Christian faith or not, um, to connect with people from that deep place of knowing that I'm a child of God and everybody is a child of God. Everyone is created in the image of God and I am no more worthy or no less worthy than anybody else of God's love, partly because I don't have to be worthy, <laughs> because God's love comes first and it's God who tells us who we are. It's God who gives us our value. And the only difference is I am learning that and claiming that for myself. Um, and not everybody hears that message. Not everybody's claimed it yet. Um, but I feel like my job in relationships uh, with friends and strangers alike is to treat them as someone who is beloved by God just as much as I am. Mm -hmm. And so that leads into not just kindness, but also justice. You know, that um, just because I was born on this side of town and someone else was born on that side of town with different schools and different experiences doesn't make me any better or worse than someone else. And part of my job is to help all of us flourish in God's kingdom um, and do what I can in, in this life to help everybody know that they're loved and worthy. I love that. I think about, um, I have two sisters and I, I love my sisters and we are very, very different people. We are all very, very uh, strong Christians, but we, we just differ on a lot of things, personalities and things like that. And I think about what it means to be a child of God and all these other people are our beloved children of God, all these people in this world, and um, and we have the same parent, and God loves us all the same. All, God has, has sent His Son to love and redeem all of us, and that's amazing. And if I can get along as the child of my parents with my two sisters, I need to extend that same love and that same grace to all the children of God all the children of God in, in this whole world. And that means not just a, a feeling of love. It means, I, I love the way that you phrased it, and I'm going to completely mess that up, but but loving them, but also seeking justice for them and, and making this world and their lives better and, and helping to express God's love in a, a holy way to those who have experienced it in a tangible way and, and those who have not experienced and realized that they are uh, given God's grace and to help them to, to know how loved they are by the way that I loved them, to express God's love in the way that I love my neighbor as well. I think I would add to what we've talked about uh, to the idea of us being children of God, 
we're also citizens of the kingdom. And that's where I think that we can make an impact if we view ourselves giving a higher allegiance to this kingdom that's breaking into this world. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, living out in our lifestyles, particularly what Jesus taught, turning the other cheek, uh, giving up self-righteousness, trusting God. If we can live that out realistically, we show others that we are not just citizens of this state or this nation or this world, but we are children who also have the responsibilities of carrying the banner, if you will, of God's kingdom. That's one of the more puzzling phrases, I think, in the New Testament, hidden with Christ. One of the things that helps me understand that is the Paul, uh, excuse me, the word that Paul used is where we get our word crypt, as in we're buried, we're hidden. People don't see us anymore. And I like to think of hidden in Christ, meaning that once we've encountered Christ, once we've been transformed through faith and through His grace, we start living a lifestyle in such a way. We start thinking, we start feeling, we start talking, we start acting so differently that people will not recognize us. In a sense, it's like, who are you? Because we are now children of God and we know whose allegiance our lives uh, must be shaped by our commitment to Him. I love that. I love thinking that uh, that we are so shaped by um, by the love of Christ and by who Christ is in us that the world sees us differently and wonders who is this person and what are they about. And I think that's a lot uh, of what it means to be a Christian is that we are so transformed by the love of Christ. We are so transformed by by all that Christ would have would have us to do and who. God has intended us to be, that that's what the world now sees. And it looks very different than what the world would expect. And so as Christians, we have that wonderful benefit of being with Christ, hidden with Christ, as we go out into this world and share the good news. I have the image of, um, I think of hiding in some ways as negative, like, oh, I'm hiding. <laughs> but another image in scripture of the, <clears throat> of the mother hen you know, protecting her young. And that mm. there are times when I just need to crawl under Jesus' wing mm. and just be with Christ for a while. So that's, that's an image that comes to my mind. And also a, another um, piece of wisdom that I received from a spiritual director, actually, who said that the, the more you know yourself, the, the more deeply you dive into yourself, the closer you come to Christ. Mm. That... Um, being honest about who you are, being open about your vulnerabilities, your brokenness, your need, your story, that draws you closer in relationship with Christ. And somehow the grace of Christ shows through more brightly in those places that are cracked open. And so those are just a couple of images that come to mind with this very complicated, hard to understand verse about being hidden in Christ. It makes it more of a, a positive image than a negative hiding image for me.